Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler and in today's video we are going to do the long-awaited life sciences paper one prediction for the final exam in 2022. Now as you watch this video I want you to keep one thing in mind it is just a prediction so please don't leave out any sections of work. Um, keep in mind that what I'm saying here is these are the questions I think they're going to ask and therefore when you watch this video you should spend some time practicing past questions on these particular topics and these styles of questions so that you get better at them if they do show up in the exam. Also throughout this video I am going to include some screenshots of perfect examples of questions that you can practice with so if you want you can pause the video or go back to them and attempt them while you revision that's a great way to start for this but I also want you to know that I haven't seen the paper I don't know what is in the paper and all of these predictions and assumptions that I'm making are based off of my own teaching experience the fact that I mark papers at the end of the year and I have some inkling and some idea into how examiners think and what they want out of you when you answer questions. So that's how I have come to this particular prediction video today. Another thing I want to remind you also going into this paper is that there has been a slight change in the structure of the final paper, especially if you are a matriculant from a few years ago. You need to know that in paper one, there is no longer any meiosis. It's all in paper two. And also there is no more essay question. And that's only really applicable for anybody who had written their matric before 2020 and is now rewriting now you should be aware of that and you should go and look at where those marks have now been allocated to so let's get into the first section of the exam which is going to be question one and question one is always going to be simple one word answers um, and it's where we can get a lot of marks considering it's 50 marks of the paper now, if we look at a trend that I'm seeing in multiple choice, there seems to be a, a heavier emphasis on knowing your eye disorders, the layers of the eye, the layers that we see in embryonic development, um, both in an embryonic egg, um, but also in our mammals as well. So think words like um, chorion, amnion, chorionic villi, placenta, uh, alliantoi, yolk, those kinds of words are showing up quite frequently in the multiple choice section. And then the last thing I'm seeing a lot of in the multiple choice questions is a overlap between uh, the hormones and their function. So generally, it's a situation that they give you. Someone doesn't have enough sugar, they have too much salt, whatever it may be. And then you have to select the correct option that's being given to fix their problem. And it's often accompanied with a graph. And what we're noticing is generally the last one to two multiple choice questions at the end are application questions. So that means expect to see a graph or you have to interpret the graph, interpret the table. There is a little bit more thinking. So they generally stagger the multiple choice from easiest in the beginning to harder at the end. Now we move on to the terminology section. Now the terminology section is a really big deal, everybody, because if you don't do well enough in this section, it's a good indicator that you're not gonna do so well later on because if you can't use the words and you can't define them, you won't be able to use them to explain things later on. So this is often a good indicator if you're doing practice exams of whether or not you are going to do well. And some of the frequent words that are coming up is words that examiners feel are often overlooked. And some of the words that I see here very often are words like synapsis. We often overlook this word um, because we focus heavily on nerves and the reflex arc and um, the different nervous systems, but we very, very rarely focus a lot of attention on the synapses. And I think that has to do with the fact that you don't have to be able to explain how um, an electrical impulse moves from one uh, uh, neuron to the next. But uh, there definitely is um, a lot of terminology around neurons and the synapse that I think we need to focus in on for this exam. Um, another set of terms that comes up quite frequently again, as I mentioned in uh, section one or section A in the multiple choice, 
is the embryonic layers as well as the embryonic development. So things like blastocyst, marula, um, zygote, uh, placenta, chorionic villi. Now, finally, we get to the A, B, both or none section. So you've got to keep in mind what's the purpose of this particular question. The examiner uses this question to see whether or not you confuse commonly mistaken words for each other. And so a good way to study for this and prepare for this is to have a collection of words that sound similar or have similar meanings. Um, and a good example that we've seen previously is things like corpus luteum and corpus callosum. They are very different structures, but they start with the same word. And so that can trick people. Um, something we see also regularly is things like cranial nerve, spinal nerve, parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system. I also see a lot of disorders and that is because again we don't spend a lot of time on the disorders and we don't maybe study them as much as we should and if you get Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis for example they are often confused with one another and you won't know which one to choose. So I suggest also and keep this in mind for all of your sections if there is a disorder in paper one that you need to know please know the difference between the two. And the disorders can be in the nervous system, the endocrine system, um, the reproductive system, any disorder that you have done this year, make sure you have a little list of them so that you don't confuse them with one another. Now let's get into the final section in question one, which are questions 1.4 to 1.5. Sometimes they go to 1.62, but these are the questions that I like to call the label and identify questions. So what you're going to get is questions based around a diagram um, and you're going to have to label structures, identify them based off of their function. Um, a lot of it's going to be one word answers like give the letter and um, give the function short answers. Um, but what kind of questions is going to come up there? Well, historically, they rotate through a few of the same topics over and over again. And it does impact the questions later on. So I am going to say this now. I do think that one of the questions that's going to show up in question one is going to be the ear. You have the label sections of the ear, maybe give a couple of functions here or there, but nothing too detailed. Because if I say the ear comes now, the only other thing that can happen later on then is the eye. They're never going to double up on two sections on the ear only and then not ask you anything about the eye. But with that being said, I do think there is room for another ear question later on, which I am going to bring up when we get to section um, B, which is question two and three. The next question I expect to see in question 1.4 or 1.5 is going to be some kind of gametes question. It's been very, very popular recently. Um, you may be expected to even draw a gamete, label one. Um, identify it from a picture, but keep in mind that you're not just identifying gametes here, okay? This is important. You may also be identifying the structures that make these gametes. So it's often things like a female reproductive system, and then they will ask you something about where in this diagram is an ovum made, and um, can you draw and label a, an ovum? Um, can you um, tell us where in the diagram does fertilization take place? So when I speak about gametes, gamete production, and the human reproductive system question, that's what I see in question 1.4 and 1.5. Now let's get into the harder section of the paper, right? Question two and question three. But I want you to know that all these predictions of the questions I'm making now could potentially land up in two or three. Their placement doesn't really change their uh, presence of whether or not they're there. So what do I expect to see this year in question two? Well, I think there is going to be a homeostasis question on aldosterone. They haven't asked it in a really long time. And often I find that regulation of salt in the body is one of the more harder ones because you have to know more than one corrective measure, there's more than one substance involved, um, and it requires you to have quite a good understanding of um, osmoregulation to answer the question. But what I also suspect is that if they're going to do the um, aldosterone question, they're going to overlap it with sweating and thermoregulation. The two go really well together, just like 
ADH, uh, which is water regulation, and sweating also go really well together. But I think this year they're going to hone in and focus on the regulation of salt. The next question that I foresee coming up in our paper in question two or in question three is going to be, of course, a human reproduction question. Now, in every paper, there will be at least one male question and one female question. Well, I think this year the application question around hormones is going to sit around the male reproductive system. And there's been a really a new trend, an upward trend that I've noticed pretty much in every paper, which focuses in on infertility a lot or disorders associated with the different um, reproductive system. And so because of this new trend, you should see something like this happen again. And because of the order in which uh, we've had these questions before, I do think there is going to be something about the male reproductive system and the hormones of the male reproductive system maybe not working properly, maybe a contraceptive. I think that a question that has been long forgotten and that will make a reappearance now is definitely a female reproductive question because they haven't asked very much about it previously in um, ovulation and FSH and LH and progesterone and estrogen and there's just so much that you can ask on the female reproductive system that it often lends itself to a question and not only just a, a difficult question but an investigation question and that's something that I need you to keep at the back of your head. With that being said that does mean you need to know things like the uh, aim, the independent and dependent variable, you need to know reliability, validity and wait for it Please remember that you need to be able to draw a graph. You have to be able to draw a bar graph, line graph, histogram, and even a pie chart. Now, let's not play with fate either, everybody. They haven't asked for a pie chart since 2018 in paper one. Anything can happen this year, so I suggest you prepare for that just in case. Make sure that you have your compass and your protractor and your ruler ready to go. Now, one last thing that is a big trend in these investigation questions is going to be calculating a percentage, but not any percentage, everybody. They've been asking to calculate the percentage increase or the percentage decrease, and it seems to be a very common question. So you should be able to do that and calculate that in order to get the two to three marks that they allocated. So let's move on to plant hormones. How are they going to ask plant hormones this year? Well, looking at the history of the questions and what hasn't come up in a while, I do think we are going to see a geotropic question this year. But on top of that, what I also want to caution you, because I've also seen this also creep up as well, is that plant hormone questions aren't just on tropisms anymore. They also like to, because they have a few extra marks now, because there isn't an essay question, they are liking to ask a few more questions on the other aspects of plants. In particular, things like physical protection and mechanical protection that plants have, as well as not forgetting that there are actually other hormones that we do in plants. The examiner really likes application questions. And there's only so many topics that lend themselves to application. And so what we often see now is application where there's a crossover. And what they like to do is they like to take a little bit of human reproduction and a little bit of uh, reproductive strategies and we sandwich them together. So think of this as like the oviviparous uh, or, 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 or viviparous um, question with a little bit of human reproduction put in there because there is some similarities and overlaps there you know they might be asking about parental care and then the fact that you have the placenta and what's the difference between the yolk and the different sizes but then if you have a placenta what kind of advantages does that have so i think you can see what i'm trying to get at here because they're complementary they can do one of these sandwich questions now let's move into what I think is going to appear in question three of the final paper. Here I'm seeing an eye question. So for this year, I think there's going to be a question around the eye. It's going to be around accommodation and specifically also something around like astigmatism. Again, it is an eye defect that we often overlook 
along with cataracts as well. So that is something that I would pay attention to. And potentially it could ask something like, um, it, you know, identify the default in the eye, astigmatism, and then explain how wearing a certain uh, lens will help you accommodate the eye, or maybe you have to describe accommodation currently in the eye while it's damaged. Um, and that means you have to know how to explain accommodation, but then match it with astigmatism, that there'll be two focal points and therefore blurry vision. Likewise, with the ear, um, the ear hasn't had a lot of emphasis in the last couple of years. That's why I mentioned it in the first question. Right now, they can bring it up again and they can ask you, and I think they're going to probably ask you about balance and equilibrium. Most of the time, what they're asking you is, if structure A is damaged, what's the effect? If structures C, which could be the ossicles, if they're not doing their job, how does that impact hearing? And so what you're seeing a lot more of is you're not actually telling me uh, what they are doing. Instead, your answers need to be, well, they are damaged, broken, have a disease, and then they can't do the following things. So they can't vibrate, they can't amplify, therefore we cannot hear. So that's how your answer would need to change. Now for my final question that I think is gonna show up in this paper somewhere is definitely going to be a overlap question between homeostasis and the endocrine nervous system situation. And the reason why I say that is because in your guideline, it actually says you are supposed to be able to see the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So what you have to do is take stock now of which of the glands has an overlap with the nervous system. And some of those glands that we see an overlap with is going to be the thyroid. It is also the adrenal gland. And I see there being some kind of emphasis on like the metabolism and potentially how the nervous system is linked to um, the adrenal gland, and like speeding up um, processes or slowing them down. Um, I'm seeing this being an investigation question though. One other suspicious question that I foresee coming up in this exam is going to be a glucose homeostasis question. Probably it's going to be an investigation question, like an application question. Um, and they may even do something where they overlap that with water, um, probably because they want you to know that like, if you change the osmolarity of the blood, you also change the water levels of the blood. You know, things like why do diabe uh, diabetics have excessive thirst, you know? Um, you've got to see how some of these subjects overlap and therefore like create a question. Now, I hope that this video was useful to you as you prepare for your final exams. And please remember to keep in mind that are just predictions, everybody. Please don't ignore any sections. Please make sure that you're thoroughly going over everything and be prepared for anything. Remember the purpose of this video was to prepare you for the worst case scenarios, the questions that maybe you forgot to go over and you need a little bit of guidance on what to focus on. And that's what you should do with the pieces of information I've given you today. Please also keep an eye out for paper two prediction, which will be coming out in the next two days, if I remember correctly. So this one is coming out on Friday and the next one is going to be out on Monday. It gives you a full week to prepare substantially for the next paper. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed. Also, if you're looking for more help with your exam questions, you should check out my exam playlist where I walk you through questions and very tricky ones as well that you might end up having to answer this year. And I'll see you all again soon. Bye.